Hi, thanks for watching the video. I'm going to try I have to keep it to less than 10 minutes. I just want to go over some of the slides I didn't have time to do during the introduction uh, to help you think a bit about theories of media effects and media theories in general, and also related to NWICO. So as you can see on your screen there, I'm going to look at these first three uh, slides first. The media effects models. The most basic fundamental theory of media, or maybe one of the first series of media to come out in media effects was the hypodermic needle, the direct effects model, which focuses on how media content can have a direct effect upon how we think and how we act. So this is also known sometimes as a hypodermic needle model, meaning that uh, if you get the message right, it will make us think or act in certain ways. And that model is mostly not taken uh, to be true nowadays, but nonetheless it's, it's an underlying principle. And if you see from one to five here, uh, they sort of all various different versions of that model saying yes, cultural habits can be reinforced or we can get long term slowly, we can have effects which happen, we can get desensitized to violence, or we can use what we see on the media to learn about certain things and we may or may not carry them out. The uses and gratification model at the bottom focuses on people choosing what they want to use the media for, which is a different angle. So these are a number of theories which are relevant, and you should be thinking about media theories, media effects models, um, so that you, uh, for your research, in order to understand how media works in society. On the right here, there's a quote by Tomlinson, who's one of the required readings for media imperialism. And he's just saying that, and it's an important point he makes, is that those people who link media imperialism and cultural imperialism are doing it on the basis of an assumption of media effects. So media imperialism means that some countries have, have media industries, industries which dominate other media industries in other countries in terms of content, technology, and so on. And then the assumption is often is if you have a lot of media content which comes from another country, then that country will also culturally dominate another country. And it's an assumption which is based on an assumption of media effects. And so it, it's debatable and we'll see some alternatives. This is another way of laying out some paradigms of media, uh, media effects models. Behaviorist model also based on short term immediate effects. The incorporation resistance model more based on ideological, how dominant ideologies are reproduced through the media, but nonetheless there can be resistance, and the resistance is in the, in the way that people will read different things into the media content, which are not necessarily intended by the dominant uh, uh, ideology. So spectacle performance relates more to the type of media, which is content which has become a lot more common in the last, uh, uh, recently, such as reality shows or where you have audience participation and the idea being that the audience is part of the content or the show as well and performance is relevant there because when people are audiences uh, in audiences or the audience performs certain roles and also this relates to I, how they have see themselves in terms of identity and the last one is habit and practice just talking about media being saturated media saturated society so many parts of our everyday lives are influenced by and integrated with media practices. And that's also another way to look at media in our societies. This is just looking at how different types of methods are associated with different theories, which is important to think of when you're doing research into media. And this, the famous quote here, the people formerly known as the audience brings into play the internet and the importance of how the internet has enabled people who uh, to be less passive and be able to produce content as well. So you get the idea of the producer, the producer, uh, the, 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 the user who's also a producer. And here just a little, uh, I'll be seeing this more in later lectures, but this is a classic How to Read Donald Duck. It is a classic uh, book which was produced in the 70s after the the military dictatorship overthrew the, 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 the elected socialist government in Chile, and the US government was actively involved in supporting the military dictatorship. And they, what they did in this book is they looked at the type of comics that were being imported uh, from America, 
And they argue that they are producing dominant uh, anti-socialist, pro-capitalist ideologies. So you can see here, there's Donald Duck, and then the revolutions have been captured. He says the revolutionaries have been captured. Donald Duck's all pleased. And then the king is saying thank you to the three nephews who stopped the revolution. And Donald Duck is saying, I hope they will ask for lots of money. So the argument here is that these comics were being used to indoctrinate the children of Chile and other places into pro-capitalist, anti-socialist uh, ideas. Um, this is talking about international and transnational media effects. International is a relationship between countries, between nations. Transnational is movements of people or, or media, trade, which are not uh, directly uh, controlled by states. So on the left here, it's uh, just uh, diasporas. So that's to talk about movements of people. You can see how there are large amounts of Chinese outside of China. And obviously, when, when groups of people move out and they bring their culture with them, and nowadays they bring also a lot of media content, and they can also keep contact back with their homeland a lot easier now. Uh, and so that will affect flows of media. The number five here in the middle, that's just an image of a rhizome. A rhizome is a way of thinking about movement of people or things or, or anything in terms of how it's decentralized. Each node, each point can make more around it. So you just imagine one person goes to a new country and then they start to influence people around them and more people join that person there. And so you can get decentralized networks. So it's just a way of visualizing change and movements, which is not newly unilinear and not, uh, which is somewhat unpredictable as well. The number six picture here is Upin and Ipin. And it's, it's, a, it's a cartoon by Malaysians, which is a Malaysian cartoon, but it's popular, it's been exported around and in particular, for example, in Turkey, and it's just as an example of how media flows are not only going from uh, the dominant countries, America, Europe, but also a country like Malaysia is able to produce content and export it to other countries. So it's about counter flows of media contents. And then Betty, Ugly Betty here on the right. Ugly Betty actually started as a Colombian uh, soap opera or show and it has become worldwide, but, but it works as a franchise. So basically what happens is people pay to use a name, but then they will rewrite the scripts in ways which suit their own country and, and kind of culture. And that's what's often known as glo localization, the localization, the global localization of media content. So for example, in China, Ugly Betty doesn't have any brothers or sisters and it's rewritten for different countries. So that's a very interesting book, it's in the library and very relevant to this unit. This is just another map. You can see the map here that yes, we have decentralization. Yes, we have counter flows, but this is showing the global traffic map, map of media in 2010. So it's getting a bit old, but you can see how a lot of it is coming from the USA and, uh, and from Europe there. So there's still a, a domination by some central powers, which is important to remember. Media policy is also important particularly when talking about international issues, international relations, the ways in which uh, countries and international trade bodies will regulate media is important. The classic uh, way of analyzing media is often in terms of industry and technology, and technologies and industry are often aligned together. So print press, for example, is often regulated in a particular way. This is really related to uh, UK or Western models. Broadcasting, television, radio, there was more restriction. You couldn't just open a radio con a radio or television station yourself. And the idea of the common carrier here on the right is that, for example, telephone lines, that people who provide telephone lines don't get to, to control the content in any way. So this has been the classic way of, of, um, of dividing up media industries. However, the internet and digitalization has very much changed this in many ways. And what's happened is now, because everything can go over the internet, uh, television broadcasting, interpersonal contact, te telephones, all kinds of uh, content are all becoming on the same platform. Basically, they all run through computers. And many different types of media can be overlapped and overlaid and intermixed and so on. 
And so it's really posed a challenge to the conventional ways of regulating policy. And that's a very important part of the international relations and international issues and communications. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you.